The second commandment binds us to reverence toward God. Most gravely, it binds us to reverence toward God in the way we worship Him. The third commandment tells us when, that is, the very day, we must worship God. And the first precept of the church tells us how God requires that we worship Him, that is, by what right or ritual, namely, the holy sacrifice of the Mass. In the last program, I quoted from the first letter to the Corinthians, in which St. Paul tells women that they must not presume to be present at Mass with their heads uncovered. This injunction calls to mind a number of passages in Holy Writ, in which God makes it very clear that He requires that we approach Him in worship, in a spirit and an attitude of reverential fear, and with a very deliberate formalism. The New Catechism reminds us that, in addition to the Ten Commandments of God, there are six precepts of the Church. We must always think of the first precept in connection with the Third Commandment. Concerning the first precept, paragraph 2042 says, quotations, The first precept, you shall attend Mass on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation, requires the faithful to participate in the Eucharistic celebration when the Christian community gathers together on the day which commemorates the resurrection of the Lord. Close quotation. On the subject of reverence, there are four places in the Old Testament which especially merit our attention. The first is in the book of Exodus. Quotations. And the Lord appeared to Moses in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he saw that the bush was on fire and was not burnt. And Moses said, I will go and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he went forward to see, he called to him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he answered, Here I am. And he said, Come not nigh hither. Put off the shoes from thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. From the book of Exodus, the third chapter, the second to the fifth verses. In this passage, we see that what a person wears does matter to God. The conciliar priests and bishops have, without any authority, dispense those who enter the churches from any proper or even modest apparel. It would be a sin worthy of strong reprobation if they were merely careless or timid in this matter. The sin is all the graver because they welcome and encourage this disrespect among the whole Catholic community. Our second text is also from the book of Exodus. Quotations. And Basilio made of violet and purple, scarlet and fine linen, the vestments for Aaron to wear when he ministered in the holy places as the Lord commanded Moses. So he made an ephod of gold, violet and purple, and scarlet twice dyed, and fine twisted linen with embroidered work. And he cut thin plates of gold and drew them small into threads, that they might be twisted with the woof of the aforesaid colors. And two borders coupled one to the other in the top on either side, and a girdle of the same colors as the Lord had commanded Moses. He prepared also two onyx stones, fast set and closed in gold, and graven by the art of a lapidary with the names of the children of Israel. And he set them in the sides of the ephod, for a memorial of the children of Israel, as the Lord had commanded Moses. He made a rational with embroidered work, according to the work of the ephod, of gold, violet, purple, and scarlet twice dyed, and fine twisted linen, four square double, of the measure of a span. And he set four rows of precious stones in it. In the first row was a sardius, a topaz, an emerald, in the second, a carbuncle, a sapphire, and a jasper. In the third, a ligorius, an agate, and an amethyst. In the fourth, a chrysolite, an onyx, and a beryl, set and enclosed in gold by their rows. And the twelve stones were engraved with the names of the twelve tribes of Israel, each one with its several names. 
They made also in the rational little chains linked one to another of the purest gold, and two hooks, and as many rings of gold, and they set the rings on either side of the rational, and two hooks, and as many rings of gold, on which rings the two golden chains should hang, which they put into the hooks that stood out in the corners of the ephod. These, both before and behind, so answered one another that the ephod and the rational were bound together, being fastened to the girdle and strongly coupled with rings, with a violet fillet joined, lest they should flag loose and be moved one from the other, as the Lord commanded Moses. They made also the tunic of the ephod all of violet, and a hole for the head in the upper part of the middle, and a woven border round about the hole, and beneath at the feet pomegranates of violet, purple, scarlet, and fine twisted linen, and little bells of the purest gold, which he put between the pomegranates at the bottom of the tunic round about, to wit, a bell of gold and a pomegranate, wherewith the high priest went adorned when he discharged his ministry as the Lord had commanded Moses. They made also fine linen tunics with woven work for Aaron and his sons, and mitres with their little crowns of fine linen, and linen breeches of fine linen, and a fine girdle of fine twisted linen. They made also the plate of sacred veneration of the purest gold, and they wrote on it with the engraving of a lapidary, the Holy of the Lord. And they fastened it to the mitre with a violet fillet, as the Lord had commanded Moses. From the book of Exodus, the 39th chapter, the 1st to the 30th verses. When we read this passage, many things impress us. The observations I wish to make are that the dress of the priest represents and interprets his place and his task. It is only if ritual is very formal and precisely prescribed and delineated, and every part of it recognized as imposed from on high, that its proper message will be understood. And the message that must be understood is that the exterior ceremonial expresses the sentiments of the soul, and the sentiments of the soul must be in conformity with the external rites. And note well, no thought is given to the priest's comfort. Palestine is semi-desert, and during the forty years of the wandering, the Israelites were in the Sinai desert. Still, the priests were required to wear the elaborate, ornate, and heavy vestments and accessories here described in every temperature, even during the holocausts, when the sacrificial victims were roasted. The priests were required to carry out the ceremonies and did it to the letter. The third scriptural excerpt is from the first book of Perlopomenon, the thirteenth chapter, the ninth verse. Quotations. And when they came to the floor of Chidon, Oza put forth his hand to hold up the Ark of the Covenant, for the ox being wanton had made it lean a little on one side. And the Lord was angry with Oza and struck him, because he had touched the Ark, and he died there before the Lord. Close quotations. Oza's act was well-intentioned, and it was done without thought or attention. Morally, we classify it as an indeliberate, imperfect act, not even as a venial sin. The Lord's reaction affords us an insight into His scale of values, particularly regarding sins of irreverence and thoughtlessness. In order to teach all men for all future times of His holiness and of the holiness of all of His possessions and all the things which pertain directly to Him, the good God took the life of this man, Yet our conciliar bishops and priests do not think that a special dress and a special deportment and a special silence is called for in God's house, where some of them, if not all, say that He is corporeally present. I put it this way because, of course, many Catholic clerics no longer believe in the real presence. They teach the people that God loves the person and not His clothes. This is so. But the holiness and augustness of God and Christ and His earthly dwelling place require that those who claim they love God dress and conduct themselves with a propriety which is special to the place and the occasion. 
Why do the priests not require this? Do we really need to ask? It is because of the incomparable dignity of the human person. Another biblical passage in which God teaches us of reverence is to be found in the sixth chapter of the prophecy of Isaiah's quotations. In the year that King Ozias died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and elevated, and his train filled the temple. Upon it stood the seraphims. The one had six wings, and the other had six wings. With two they covered his face, and with two they covered his feet, and with two they flew. And they cried one to another, and said, Holy, 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 the Lord God of hosts, all the earth is full of his glory. And the lintels of the doors were moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, because I have held my peace, because I am of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people that hath unclean lips. And I have seen with my eyes the King, the Lord of hosts. And one of the seraphims flew to me, and in his hand was a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs of the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this hath touched thy lips, and thy iniquities shall be taken away, and thy sin shall be cleansed. From the prophecy of Isaiah, the sixth chapter, the first seven verses. This passage reminds us of the unspeakable holiness and purity of God and heaven, the abode of God. If the angels, who are themselves perfectly holy, show such awe and trepidation in the presence of the infinite Lord and His dwelling place, how is it that the conciliar bishops and priests simply because the bishops of the world met in council in the 1960s, no longer see it as their duty to require some semblance of respect toward God, toward the Eucharistic Christ, toward the sacred precincts of the churches. Why have they taught the people, since the council, to abandon the old formalities and decorum, such as neatness, cleanliness, the folding of the hands, genuflections and kneeling, silence, and attentiveness to nothing but the divine presence on the altar, or wherever they have relegated the sacred host. If you should ask this question of your pastor, dear listener, you will not get a true answer, if you get any at all. The true answer to the question is that his faith has grown cold, or perhaps it would be better to say his faith has been diverted What can we infer from all these readings? The most important observation is that the Lord God deals with men as human beings composed of body and soul and not as disembodied spirits. Modern people, who are forever putting forth some high-sounding notion whose ultimate purpose is to make things easier for themselves, say that he is not concerned about the body or its appearances or deportment, but the heart. Very obviously he is. I answer that God is interested in everything. He is a stickler for details. Sanctity is in the details. Some may argue that what God required in the Old Testament he has absolved us from in the New. The proper response to such a contention is that human beings have not changed with respect to their nature. If God required a certain dress and demeanor in the Old Testament... It was not because he demanded anything for himself as one in need of something. If he commanded anything, it was because man needed that he command them and direct them and evoke from them. It goes without saying that God is keenly aware of the nature of man and he knows what is good for him. What is good for man with respect to the worship of his maker is that there be ritual Ritual entails physical activity, spoken and sung prayers, a prescribed ceremony, often repeated. It requires the gathering of the whole people for the specific purpose of worship. It requires that they be in a frame of mind that befits the act of worship, not their merrymaking, which means that they are not supposed to combine the two types of activity. Ritual is for God, 
merrymaking is for man. Liturgy may be enjoyable, but that it be enjoyed by its celebrants is not an end of the act. The crucifixion was liturgy. It was hardly enjoyable for the celebrant. Modern men have confused the love of God and the love of man, the worship of God and the worship of man, and the worship of God and their entertainment. They began by saying that liturgy should be beautiful, festive, artful, enjoyable, engrossing, attractive, captivating, and such things, and finished by saying that whatever we enjoy, he will accept. Such is God's affection for men, they said, that he will be glad to accept anything which men offer, so long as they have good intentions, as mothers and fathers are pleased to receive the childish scribblings of their children. This is altogether untrue. God will not be content to receive just any kind of ceremonial which men may devise. Another essential note about ritual is that it conform to what has been prescribed, that it be ritualistic. I have quoted from the Old Testament because it is there that we learn the essentials of ritual, what God demands. What is noteworthy is that not only does he require sacrifice, but he requires ceremonial, and he requires ceremonial conduct and habiliment. What the participants wear does matter. God enjoins men to dress for the occasion and for the task. As I said earlier, when I quoted from the 31st chapter of Exodus, it was noteworthy that God gave no thought to the comfort of the priests when he was designing their vestments. We may assume that he is not concerned with whether the people are in comfortable attire also. Two things else are remarkable here. The first is that the priests were a select group. Everyone cannot be a priest because the priest acts for the whole assembly. What he does is in their behalf and it is a task which everyone cannot do. The priest is someone who has been selected for the task. When the Lord Jesus said that the hour cometh and now is when true adorers shall adore the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father also seeketh such to adore him. God is a spirit, and they that adore him must adore him in spirit and in truth. When he spoke these words, I say, he did not mean that thenceforth only the interior disposition mattered. He meant that in the new law the worship of God would be adequate, whereas in the Old Testament it was decidedly imperfect and purely preparatory. The worship of the old law was acceptable because it was the best that was possible, and it was what God had prescribed as a preparation and an instruction for what was coming. But it would be replaced by a ceremony of His institution, and it would be eminently satisfactory and pleasing to God the Father because it would be the unbloody sacrifice at which His only begotten Son would be the invisible but chief priest and the perfectly acceptable offering, again invisible, but very really present. A traditional rendering of the third commandment of the Decalogue is, Remember to keep holy the Sabbath day. The New Catechism, quoting the book of Exodus, gives it as, The seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. On the subject of the Sabbath day, our text has many good things to say, which I would like to recommend that you read. But as I have said before, I cannot recommend this book to anyone. It must either be revised or burned. Paragraph 2180 says the following, quotations. The precept of the true church specifies the law of the Lord more precisely. On Sunday and other holy days of obligation, the faithful are bound to participate in the Mass. The precept of participating in the Mass is satisfied by assistance at a Mass which is celebrated anywhere in a Catholic rite, either on the holy day or on the evening of the preceding day. Close quotations. 
I hope we shall be able to return to this subject again. For the present, I must strongly urge that it is impossible to fulfill one Sabbath day obligation Saturday evening. The conciliar church has no authority to change the Sabbath day. Those who fail to assist at the true Mass on Sunday itself, for no good reason, commit a mortal sin. From the first Pentecost, the Christian Sabbath was Sunday, which began at midnight. This innovation had the purpose which has been fulfilled, the destruction of the Sunday. It is a very clear sign of how far from the faith the bishops and the priests, their pastors, have taken the faithful sheep that one fine day in the 1970s, the priests announced from the pulpits throughout the world that from now on, one could fulfill one's Sabbath obligation on Saturday evening, that instead of asking questions, the faithful welcomed the word and proceeded to plan how they would spend Sunday, which had been taken from the Lord and given to them. What an utterly convenient idea our beloved priests have come up with this time and to think of how hard it used to be fasting from midnight, getting up for early Mass in order not to get so hungry before breakfast. Notice what the first meal of the day is called. The liturgical renewal, which was aimed at awakening the people to the riches of their liturgical heritage, was supposed to make them aware of the holiness and sacrosanctness of the Sunday. Inexplicably, It produced an artifice whereby the people could live their whole lives and never once go to church on Sunday, an innovation which made it possible for the people to catch a quick 5.30 Mass on Saturday and have the rest of the evening and all the next day for themselves, for sleeping, for television, for traveling, for shopping, for uninterrupted yard work. When someone finally thought to ask the Lord about their turning his day into a holiday, he answered, Speak to the children of Israel, and thou shalt say to them, See that thou keep my Sabbath, because it is a sign between me and you in your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctify you. Keep you my Sabbath, for it is holy unto you. He that shall profane it shall be put to death. He that shall do any work in it, his soul shall perish out of the midst of his people. Six days shall you do work, and the seventh day is the Sabbath, the rest holy to the Lord. Every one that shall do any work on this day shall die. Let the children of Israel keep the Sabbath and celebrate it in their generation. It is an everlasting covenant between me and the children of Israel and a perpetual sign For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and in the seventh he ceased from work. From the book of Exodus, the 31st chapter, the 13th to the 17th verses. And sure enough, the people have violated the Sabbath, and they are dead.